My own? Good. All right. Good evening, everybody. I think it's right about 6 o'clock. We'll go ahead and uh, jump in and get started on our Bible study tonight. Can everybody see this okay? I wanted to choose a really scary color scheme because it's Revelation and it's October. Um, before we get started, let's uh, begin our time together with a word of prayer. Dear God, we thank you so much for this day that you've given us, for decisions that were made this morning, for a time of worship that spoke to our hearts, for a day of rain that, Lord, we will need one day later, I'm sure. God, we just pray for your time here tonight, God, for your presence, that we may learn more about this very complicated book of Scripture and how it speaks to our lives. pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. All right, a um, couple things. To, uh, on these Sunday evenings, which are going to be broken up a lot just because of our um, sort of traditions about um, fall break, uh, we have fall festival coming up, homecoming. So, you know, if you take copious notes and that sort of thing, that's great. Um, but we'll be kind of um, trying to fit this in hopefully by the end of the year, uh, hopefully before Advent. Uh, we'll get all this uh, tucked in. But uh, also, how many of you brought a Bible? Okay, good. I just wanted to make sure people brought a Bible because um, this isn't just going to be all me sitting up here talking. I want you to kind of make sure you, you might have to read with some people around, close by you, and that sort of thing. Uh, now, who can read this word for me? The big Out loud. Everybody at once. What does it say? Is there an S on the end of it? No. One more time. Is there an S on the end of it? No. All right. What do you think is Chris's pet peeve about the book of Revelation? Revelation. When people say Revelations. Yeah, it's the, the full title of the book is The Revelation of Jesus Christ to John, uh, not The Revelations. And so it's a single revelation. Okay, just had to go ahead and get that out of the way. Um, here's what many people think about Revelation. How many people in here have read these two books, or this one book in this book series? It's okay. I mean, I have to. Okay. I have, actually, this very same copy of Hal Lindsey's. Uh, I think it's a red gilded page, too, so it would make it extra spooky. Uh, and then, of course, Tim LaHaye, Jerry Jenkins, and now Nick Cage, I think, did Left Behind movie recently. Um, it's kind of hard to believe that book there is over. Has this got a laser pointer on it, Chris? Oh, yes. Okay. Uh, mm, that that book is, that one is over a, a decade old, I think. Uh, these both outline a form of eschatology, which is a $5 word for the study of the eschaton, or the study of the end times, uh, known as premillennial dispensationalism. If you're ever playing hangman on a family game night, dispensationalism, you win every time. Um, <laughs> Premillennial dispensationalism is a form of eschatology that started with these two dudes, uh, John Nelson Darby and C.I. Schofield. How many of you have heard of one or both of these guys? Any of you have a Schofield study Bible? Okay. Uh, Darby was the one who came up with the idea of the rapture. Uh, the rapture is not mentioned anywhere in Scripture. We're going to get to this later, actually, in the textual study of script, uh, Revelation, but I want to get this out of the way early. Uh, Darby, which, by the way, what a great shot of Darby, right? <laughs> Such a happy fellow. Um, Darby came up with this idea from reading not the English Bible, not the Greek translation of the New Testament, but a Latin translation of Paul's Thessalonian letters in which Paul says... And the dead in Christ will rise first, and we will be caught up in the air. Are you familiar with that? In Latin, it says we will be rapturad, uh, which is the only place it says that. Uh, and in that passage in Thessalonians, what Paul's actually referring to is an imperial uh, greeting. When an emperor would come into town, everyone would meet the emperor in the necropolis or in the cemetery, and then they would all come back into town with him. So what Paul is referring to is not a rapture in the sense of we all go flying naked up through the air, leaving our clothes behind, but in the sense of the dead will be resurrected, those who are living will be changed, will meet Christ, and then return back to earth. That's the New Testament teaching. Jesus comes back to earth. Not we float up to heaven, but Jesus comes back to earth. 
But Darby read that and goes, huh, that, that kind of makes more sense to me. Schofield liked what Darby had to say, took the ball and ran with it, and came out with the Schofield Bible, which connects every passage with this way of thinking, of premillennial dispensationalism, specifically around the image of the statue of Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel and that vision he has. And then he weaves this throughout the whole Bible. It became so popular in the States that people could not tell where Scripture ended and Schofield began. And, so, and I say in the States because Christians in Europe and other parts of the world who are not influenced by American Christians, this is foreign to them or wacky. They think premillennial dispensationalism is silly. It doesn't make any sense. Now, there are other forms of dispensationalism, other forms of millennialism, and we'll cross that bridge when we get there. But I wanted to sort of put this up front and tell you that the main way that most people think about Revelation is new. And if I'm being honest with you, I don't think right. So, based on the text that's there. So, with that being said, I titled the first session, Clever, right? Leaving Behind, Left Behind. See what I did there? Leaving Behind, Left Behind. So this is an introduction to apocalyptic literature and the book of Revelation. By the way, the way I teach Revelation, my job, my goal is to bore you to tears so that you do not ask me to do it again. That's my idea. So, um, so here... We're going to talk a little bit about the nature of the book of Revelation and apocalyptic literature. To begin with, we're going to look at a picture. Anybody know what this is? Anybody want to guess? Let's just look at it. What's going on in this picture? There's a dude. Got a crown of thorns in his hand. Got a cross. What color is that cross, maybe? Gold. Okay, he's standing on the Bible. You may not be able to see this as Bible. There's a dude in the back shouting at him. He's got some papers there. Anybody have any idea who this guy is? Any idea when this is from? It's about 1896. I knew Sean would know. Yeah, that's William Jennings Bryan. What do you know about William Jennings Bryan, Sean? Ran for president, yeah. Actually won, I think he was, I don't think he won, but I think he was getting close to winning the Democratic nomination for making what he called his Cross of Gold speech. Anybody heard of that? Nick, you know what it was about? You know what it was about? Yeah, he was haranguing people. But why, so all right, I'm going to tell you, and then I'm going to explain to you why, why it's important. So yeah, this is a Cross of Gold. Jennings was in favor of what was called, like, uh, I think it was called the bimetal system of uh, the economy. He believed we ought not to just rely on the gold standard, but also the silver standard. And so he made this giant, this grand speech where he said that we were going to be crucified upon a cross of gold and that, that the country had given him a crown of thorns. He used a lot of grand biblical images in talking about this. In fact, he was often criticized by other politicians for abusing Christian and biblical language in his, um, in his sort of campaign uh, speeches. Now, the reason I show you this is because now I want you to imagine me describing it this way. And lo, I saw a man with a, a cross of gold, and his right hand was a crown of thorns. He was standing on the book, on the word of God. The cross was coming forth from it. He had a victorious look upon his face, paper and satchels around his waist, and uh, there was one shouting after him something that I could not understand because I can't read the print. That sounds like Revelation, right? But we don't know what this is. You all didn't understand what this was, right? I still don't. I read up on it. It was only, what, 1896, not 200 years ago? This is what the book of Revelation is like. We're like trying to look back on an old political cartoon and we can see what it is. We know what it's there. I mean, it's right there in front of us. But without some context, without some deeper knowledge, there's no real way to understand it and what it is. So, with that being said, I want us to consider tonight seven questions about the book of Revelation. Who is the author? Who is the audience? Where was it written? How was it to be received? And I'll explain that question a little bit later. Uh, when was it written? Why was it written? And what is it? 
So now you get to do a little classwork. If you've got a Bible, somebody near you does, just find Revelation 1, 1 through 11. See how many of these seven you can answer. I'm going to give you three minutes, and then we'll, uh, we'll come back together, and we're going to take each one of them one at a time. You'll all must be working by yourselves. I don't hear any group discussion. No, that's okay. Well, let's take these one at a time. Uh, who is the author? What'd you get? John. John. All right, which John? St. Saint, Saint John? That's cheating. Where's John? Is it John the Baptist? How many for John the Baptist? He'd been D-E-D -E -D dead. What about John, brother James, son of Zebedee? Any takers? Maybe. That's a safe answer. That is the scholarly answer. Maybe. What about John the Elder as opposed to John the Younger? We'll throw John the Younger in there for fun, anybody? What about just a different John altogether? Any votes there? So y'all must have different opinions. Who do you think it is? Is it not the John that wrote the book of John? Uh, that would be John. Well, now, you, now you're getting into something. Now I'm going to chase a rabbit. I don't think John wrote the Gospel of John. but <laughs> I think it was Lazarus, but that's me and like 20% of scholarship. No, the tradition is that John, uh, son of Zebedee, or John the, the younger, the one who's pictured beardless in the Lord's Supper. Um, so, all right, any, any takers? Why do you think it's, why do you think there's so many Johns? It was a popular name. Popular name, there's a bunch of Johns now. So, yeah, so it's probably uh, some other John altogether. Uh, it's obviously not John the Baptist. Some people think that. I don't know why. Obviously not him. He would have been dead. If it was John the son of Zebedee, he would have been really old, like extremely old for his day. Uh, same thing with John the Elder, any of the Johns mentioned in the Gospels. Probably it's another John altogether. One of the things about New Testament scholarship is, or New Testament uh, authorship is it's not uncommon for someone to write in the name of someone else. That's why we have what we call pseudo-Pauline letters, like books like maybe Ephesians and Colossians are not actually written by Paul, written by people using Paul's name. And that's totally fine. People did that back in the day. And so this is probably just a guy named John. Um, so who's the audience? Uh, give this away, right? The seven churches. 
Let me ask that one more time. Who is the audience? Seven churches, seven churches that are in Asia. Is it the seven churches that are in Asia in 2015? No. No? Is it to the people gathered at First Baptist Church of Williams in 2015? No. To the seven churches that are in Asia, or really Asia Minor, modern day Turkey. Those seven churches, and these are just the uh, citations where we get to their actual talk. It's Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, uh, Theatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. And in case you're wondering where they are, um, you like these little helpful arrows I drew? Italy, Judea. So the boots like, oh, you can't see that. The boots like over here. Here's the Mediterranean. Here's Crete, Greece, Turkey. Then Judea is like down over here somewhere. But this is where they are. And um, so this is the seven churches. They're all pretty tight together. How many of you, how many of them have you heard of before outside of Revelation? Ephesus? Laodicea? Have you heard of Laodicea outside of Revelation? It's probably the most popular one. Philadelphia? It's a name we've heard of. Smyrna, maybe. Okay. These are all churches in this part of Asia Minor. Um, so where was it written? From where was it written? Patmos, the island of Patmos, right? Uh, we see that in verse 9. I, John, your brother, who share with you in Jesus the persecution and the kingdom and the patient endurance, was on the island called Patmos. Uh, Patmos was sort of like ancient Rome, Australia. What do you know about Australia? It's a penal colony. Right, it's where they sent all the the prisoners from there. So Patmos was the same, small island. It was used to exile, not, not really severe criminals, but people that just got on the authorities' nerves. So John was likely exiled to Patmos, maybe for being a Christian, maybe for some other reason. Uh, he seems to suggest in verse 9 it was because of his belief in Christ that he was exiled to Patmos. And there he was probably the kind of exile who was not, all right, we're throwing you in prison, so we're taking all your stuff. He was probably just exiled there until he got over his Christianity. That was the idea from the Romans. You're exiled until you quit annoying us, was the idea. And so, by the way, anytime you see this, uh, that's just my reference. Um, Charles Talbert, New Testament scholar at Baylor, wrote a really great little book on Revelation called The Apocalypse. And I'll also be quoting, I think his name's Ray Summers, a little book called uh, Worthy is the Lamb, and probably George Beasley Murray's uh, two or three volumes. Uh, on Revelation from the Word Biblical Commentary. Those are kind of the ones that I go to a lot for this. So, uh, so that's where it was written. In case you're wondering, see, I even highlighted Patmos here. Little bitty island right there, uh, right off the co uh, coast of Asia Minor. Uh, which, by the way, uh, Asia Minor, you know, is not like Asia, right? Like China. Okay, I just wanted to, wanted to be clear about that. Okay. Uh, so, how was it to be received? A better way for me to ask this question, probably, is what social function was the letter written? Why was it written? What, how was it to be received by the people who got it? Now, you probably couldn't find this in the first 11 verses, uh, but Talbert suggested, and this is actually true for most, if not all, of the books of the New Testament, uh, it was uh, a book that was meant to be read aloud, and probably what's called a circular letter. Uh, I mentioned Ephesians earlier, it's in the circular letter. Colossians is a circular letter. Um, some others uh, that slipped my mind, well, the Gospels were circular letters. What that meant was um, someone would write this epistle and send it to sort of the starting church. So like, for instance, take the, the, the letter to the Ephesians. The idea was it would be sent to Ephesus. All right, and the readers at Ephesus would stand up in front of the congregation there and read the epistle to the Ephesians. And then this, the sort of way it worked is they would then rub out Ephesus and write in Colossae and ship it on down the line. And when they got to Colossae, they would stand up and read the epistle for everyone to hear it. So the way this was meant to be read is not right, to a single person. It's not coded. It's not meant for them to sit down and go, okay, I've got to figure this out and figure out what all these things mean. It was meant to be read aloud to a gathered group of Christians. Now think about that for a minute. In an era before the radio, before television, before movies, to sit in a room or in a place like this and someone read the book of Revelation. Think about what that must have been like. I think some people would have been like, this is some interesting stuff. 
And some other people would probably think, they got some really good mushrooms at Patmos. <laughs> Something is going on with John. And so, I, in fact, one of the things I didn't mention, and, and I won't mention earlier, so I'll mention it now, Revelation squeaked into the New Testament. I mean, it barely, barely made it. The Council of Hippo, the Council of Nicaea, Constantinople, everybody was like, when it came down to the canon, oh, Revelation sounds kind of crazy. Let's leave it out. It sounded a little bit like the Shepherd of Hermas. It sounded like some of these other books that were a little out there. And so they were like, eh. When Luther started the Reformation, he said, I don't want that book in my canon. In fact, all he wanted was Luke and Paul's epistles. But he definitely didn't want Revelation. John Calvin, disagree or agree with him, one of the most brilliant theologians ever, wrote a book, wrote a commentary on every single book of the Bible except one. Which one do you think it was? Revelation. And nobody wanted to touch it. Okay? It was just crazy. Crazy town banana pants to them. But the fact that it made it in, I think, says more to us about it as well. So this was a book specifically meant to be read aloud. Now, I don't know how they did it. I don't know if they turned the lamps down. I don't know if they cranked them up. I don't know if they read it, you know, had their best reader to read it. But I can imagine it would have been a, a theatrical thing nonetheless. So... When was it written? Are you trying to read ahead? Because that, that's wrong, Alan. No, um, so there, I'm going to give you four possibilities. There are tons more. But here are two unlikely ones, and these are probably two of the more popular ones uh, that people have. One is during the reign of Caligula. Uh, that's, these are emperors, by the way, of Rome from around 37 to 41. Uh, that's way, way too early. Uh, the earliest book of Scripture is 1 Thessalonians, maybe James, depending on who you ask. And they're both, um, if, if you take the early authorship of James, it's written about the year 55 to 60. Uh, 1 Thessalonians is written about the year 55 to 60. Earliest gospel is Mark. It's written about 60 to 65. And so, I mean, just that date alone is, is way too early. Just a few years, actually, after the crucifixion and resurrection. Also, a man named Polycarp, have any of you heard of? That's not a kind of nasty fish in the pond, by the way. You've heard of Polycarp? Um, I have some of his writings on dietary laws if you'd like to read them. They're really interesting. Um, but Polycarp is one of the early sort of church fathers. Uh, and in his epistle to the Philippians, uh, makes a statement that the church at Smyrna did not exist during Paul's lifetime. And so Paul died around the year 64. So that should tell you if this is a letter to the church at Smyrna, Probably not written during the reign of Caligula. In fact, it's not written during the reign of Caligula. The other one is during the reign of Nero. How many of you heard of Nero before? Nero's probably the most popular uh, option here because Nero, you know, Nero was crazy. Played the fiddle while Rome burned to the ground. And then who do you blame it all? The Christians. Nero was so uh, crazy that he would take live Christians, bind them to poles, dip them in wax, and set them on fire to light candles at his party. Uh, Nero was. So you can see why it's a popular thought for Nero to have written it. Well, it's unlikely because the book of Revelation, we'll get to this uh, when it comes around to that time, refers to what's called the, the return of Nero myth. There was a myth uh, in Rome that, see, Nero had been sort of driven out. It was too crazy for them. And so there was this myth going around that Nero had gone off to the east and that Nero was still ticked at Rome and was going to come back with this like ragtag army that he had gotten in the east. And so Revelation actually picks up on this myth and talks about uh, the Nero myth. So to, to understand or to have a knowledge of this myth in, implies that it's written after the reign of Nero. Also, uh, it's unlikely because the book of Revelation refers to Rome as Babylon. And the primary reason it refers to Rome as Babylon is because Rome destroyed the temple in the same way that Babylon destroyed the temple. If you don't know any other extra biblical date, you should know the year 70. The year 70 A.D. was when the, the temple in Jerusalem was destroyed, ransacked, leveled to the ground. Uh, we can use that date to date other books in the New Testament based on their knowledge or reference to the temple. So, um, so it's very unlikely. If it destroyed in year 70, Nero's reign ends in year 68, 
So uh, Nero, probably out of the question. So here are two likely possibilities. And they also have their difficulties, but uh, it has to happen sometime in this era. Uh, one is the reign of Domitian. Uh, that's between year 81 and 96, so we're pushing later into the first century. Revelation is a late book, but probably not the latest book in the New Testament. Uh, that probably falls to Jude or Second Peter. Um, so this is a possible date uh, given the alleged persecution of Christians by Domitian in the 90s. The reason I say alleged is it's only mentioned once, and I think it's by Epiphanius. Epiphanius is the early uh, church historian. There's no other mention of Domitian actually persecuting Christians on a state uh, law level. And so um, that's one of the reasons it's kind of a popular um, way to go is with Domitian. Uh, the other is under the reign of Trajan, and I kind of think it's here, maybe the latter end of Domitian, maybe the first uh, of Trajan. Uh, but here again we have a quote from Epiphanius, quoting the Alogi, uh, that the church of Theatira did not exist during the time of John the Apostle. Well, that, that's difficult because he doesn't actually tell us when the Alogi think John the Apostle died. There were two early ways of thinking. One was John the Apostle died early in the mid-first century, and the other tradition is that he actually lived a very long time. This gives birth to the idea that John uh, the Apostle wrote the book of Revelation. So uh, either way, the takeaway from this is that Revelation is a book written during the latter part of the first century, the early part of the second, likely under the reign of Trajan, maybe Domitian. Makes sense, right? Got it? Filing it away? Okay, good. Um, all right, so now the real question. Why was it written? Book of Hope? Book of hope? The, and warning. And warning? Okay. Well, there are three uh, sort of answers to consider here. And by answers, I mean these are sort of three ways that we understand the book of Revelation. And they all sort of come in uh, to what David said in one way or another. It's persecution literature. These are all not necessarily mutually exclusive, but for the sake of our time tonight, they actually are. So there's persecution literature, therapeutic literature, or anti-assimilation literature. And we'll take these in step. Persecution literature. So this would be if we take this idea that it was written very unlikely during the reign of Nero, or a little less unlikely during the reign of Domitian, and there was an actual uh, persecution, whether it was statewide or maybe just um, uh, reserved there for Asia Minor. And Talbert says, based on the evidence at hand, one must conclude there's no evidence of state-sponsored persecution of Christians in Asia during the time of Domitian. So again, Talbert's sort of saying, and there's not an awful lot of evidence about this. Um, well, essentially, if we understand his persecution literature, we have to understand it as the people who are receiving it at the time are being persecuted. And by persecution, I mean they are being killed for being Christians. Not life is tough, not things aren't going their way, but they are being killed by their state-sponsored execution for their religion, period. And so Talbert, and, and I think that he makes a strong case, and I think others do too, uh, that this is probably not what's happening. And that's how, I don't know about you, that's how I've heard most about the book of Revelation. But history seems to point in a different direction. So the other way, which is slightly related to it, is therapeutic literature. And this is the idea that persecution may be coming, that the Romans are tightening the screws on the Christians, that the emperors don't like them that much, that Nero, maybe they took some ideas from him, or maybe there was a, a localized persecution under Domitian, but now they were worried about it spreading to Asia Minor. So as therapeutic literature, Revelation is written to say, if it comes, hold on. It'll be okay. Don't worry about it. And so, again, there's no real evidence in any apocalyptic literature. That means Revelation. That means the Shepherd of Hermas. That means Daniel. That means any sort of... If any of you heard of Shepherd of Hermas? I know I've thrown that out like twice. Now, there are a lot of extra-biblical books uh, that, are, that fall into the category of apocalyptic. There are only maybe three in our canon that really, um, on, on, on a grand scale, are apocalyptic. Revelation... Daniel, parts of Ezekiel, and then some sayings of Jesus and Matthew. Uh, but there's no real evidence in any of this to suggest that any uh, apocalyptic literature is therapeutic, especially Revelation, which brings us to anti-assimilation literature. This is actually where I fall. This is why it's last. 
You'll find a pattern here. The last thing I talk about is probably what I think. Um, and this is what a lot of most more recent scholarship agrees with. And Talbert says, um, anti-assimilation literature is literature that is addressed to Christians, some of whom advocated accommodation to the pagan culture, and some of whom were willing to assimilate to a non-Christian milieu because of their spiritual anemia and lethargy. And so this functions as a radical call, as a call to radical Christian commitment. This makes sense to me, and Talbert and some others make a compelling case for one, well, I mean, for an obvious reason. This is the latter half of the first century. Now, let's think about the development, not only of Christian theology, but of Christian eschatology in the first century. Jesus says in the presence of the disciples, surely none of you here will, will taste death until my return. He says something like that. All right, so Jesus dies, is resurrected. Now, here's where I'm going to throw a, a, a wrench in your gears. That could be the second coming he was talking about. Maybe, maybe not, probably wasn't. Uh, he's probably talking about the parousia, and he actually doesn't talk about a second coming, but anyway. So Jesus, raised from the dead, ascends to heaven, and now they're all going, okay, Jesus said we wouldn't die until the kingdom comes. Then what starts to happen? People get old and die. This is what, this is the, the crisis at Thessalonica. People are dying. And so Christians begin to die. Paul in the Thessalonian letters writes and says, all right, don't worry. Jesus is coming, but just because you die, it doesn't mean bad things are happening. Jesus is coming in a hurry, so it's okay. And then in the meantime, they'll go, hey, Jesus is coming. We don't have to do nothing. So they all get lazy. They all knock around. So Paul has to write the second letter to the Thessalonians and says, hey, Jesus is coming, but it might take a while, so you might want to try to at least live like Christians for a while. So all of this is going on, and this is in the, the, mid, the latter mid part of the first century. If this is being written at the end of the first, beginning of the second, what do you think Christian attitudes are beginning to become? I mean, it's like, kind of like it is now, right? Like, oh, well, this is our religion, but it's not who we are. All right? Jesus was coming back. We still kind of believe that, but, you know, that's been a long time, so we'll go to church on Sunday, but we'll still, you know, we, we might come over here and, and offer a sacrifice to the emperor. Or it's like, hey, you guys know the, and we'll talk a little bit about this too, the trade guilds actually operated as religions, and so people, if they were in trades in Asia Minor and in the Roman Empire, they would have to participate in the trade guild religions, and so Christians who were tradesmen who were participating in the trade guild religions were saying, well, this is how I make my money, and so I'll just be a part of this religion. And so the book of Revelation is actually the sort of radical warning, to use David's word, to say, hey, Get serious about this. It's not time to just sit around on your hands. The Christian faith, this Christian reality is real now. Something to do now. And he talks about the dangers of getting too cozy with these other religions, with the state-run things. He talks about getting too, too lethargic on other things. And so I think it makes a pretty strong case. That Revelation is not necessarily a book written to people who are being persecuted. After all, if your life was being threatened, would you really want to read a book about dragons? It's a book written to Christians who are getting a little bit cozy and comfortable and lack lackadaisical with their faith. So, that's, and, and you don't have to agree with me, but that's how uh, I, I kind of come to that conclusion. So, uh, I want to spend a little more time now talking about apocalyptic literature, because I asked, what is Revelation? So what word, and try not to read all that, but what word comes to mind when you hear apocalypse? Or what images come to mind? The end of the world. The end of the world. Planes falling out of the sky. Fire everywhere. Fire everywhere. I always think of a black hole in the middle of the solar system, I don't know. Anybody else? Come on, you, you, you got to have an imagination about this kind of stuff, right? Or else Revelation is going to be really hard to read. What else do you think about when you hear apocalypse? Blood up to the bridle of the horse. Blood up to the bridle of the horse. Great wars. Great wars. Yeah, well, that's it. Thunderdome. Destruction. Mad Max. Total chaos. I'm not talking about any destruction, though. We'll get there. 
What else comes to mind? Fire everywhere. You ever notice nobody says ice? Just as destructive. Hmm? Robert Frost did. Well, apocalypse actually, the, the word apocalypsis, apocalypta, literally just means to uncover. So if like you had dinner covered at your house, and you spoke Koine Greek, that's an apocalypse when you take it off. Right? If you were to uncover your meal, that's an apocalypse. It means you're revealing something. That's why revelation, that's what that word means, it's a revealing. You're revealing something. And so um, it falls into that genre of apocalypse. Like I said, Daniel does some parts of Ezekiel, some parts of um, some of the other prophets, and some of um, Jesus' words. Don't confuse this, by the way, uh, with the prophets. Um, I always blame, y'all remember Miss Cleo? They used to come on and be like, oh, honey, child, I'm going to read your tarot cards or whatever. My grandma loved watching those commercials. Um, people sometimes confuse prophecy with what that is, like telling the future. That ain't prophecy. Uh, the Judeo-Christian understanding of prophecy is, I mean, the textbook definition is someone speaking on behalf of God to God's people and on behalf of God's people to God. It's not future telling. It's not fortune telling. There's part of it in that, but that's not what it is. So don't be confused uh, uh, by that. This is an uncovering, the apocalypse. And so uh, Talbert uh, sort of defines the genre uh, as a genre in which a revelation is given by God to a human seer, to someone to communicate this through, uh, through an otherworldly mediator. So in this case, the reason why I say like think in Matthew's gospel, where does this apply in there? Can you think? Revelation given by God to a human seer, to Joseph, through an otherworldly mediator, through dreams, maybe through Mary, through angels. In the book of Revelation, it's given to John, through the angel that speaks to John, uh, disclosing future events and or transcendent reality. So it's not always saying, excuse me, it's not always saying this is what's going to happen, but sometimes it's saying this is what's happening that you cannot see with what you're looking for which is intended to affect the understanding and behavior of the audience. And it's important to understand that it has a present effect. One of the things, if I can stress anything to you about the book of Revelation is this. It was written first and foremost for people in the first or second century. Uh, if the book of Revelation was only written for people living in America in 2015, the, people, the churches in Asia Minor would have gotten it. You know what they would have done with it? This is crazy. I don't understand it. They'd have balled it up, thrown it in the trash, and we wouldn't have it. And so it's important to understand it was written for that particular audience. So what are some parts of apocalyptic uh, literature? One, it, it contains details about the judgment of the wicked and the vindication of the righteous as it relates to the destruction of the world and the resurrection. That's an important word, resurrection. Uh, that's the Christian understanding of the end. Not rapture not spirits floating on clouds, resurrection. And so this, you can find these, uh, not all of these, but most of these are contained in all forms of apocalyptic literature. You can see it even in the Old Testament prophets and their versions of apocalyptic literature. In Daniel, you can see it in Jesus' apocalyptic discourses. It arises out of, a multiple, uh, out of multiple social context, so that makes it difficult for us to peel it apart, to understand what it's talking about because it's trying to speak to so much. Uh, it seeks to change the behavior of the audience. That's important. It's not just a, an informational document. It's not just to say, here are household codes. These are how husbands should behave. This is how wives should behave. It seeks to actually change the people who read it. So when you read Revelation, it's not just for fun. It's supposed to stir something in you and change your behavior. And it generally involves various literary devices. And some of them uh, are symbolism. Uh, it's important to understand uh, symbolism. Symbols stand in for actual persons, events, etc. And this is what makes Revelation difficult to read and why there's varied understandings of it. Because everybody wants to read their own, own understanding into the symbols. Uh, the seven horns mean seven days of the week. Or this beast is obviously referring to this president. Or this image is obviously referring to this country. No, that's not it. And so Talbert says, Failure to take the highly symbolic character of apocalyptic literature into account virtually guarantees a misreading of the text. 
I think he says that perfectly, is why I included it in there. If you take those symbols lightly, try to push your own understanding into the symbols, you're going to misread the text every single time. It's why there have been so many pastors and theologians, so-called over the years, who have said, I figured out Revelation, I know what it's about, I know what the signs are, and this is the day the world's going to end. And they've all been dead, and they've all been wrong. Most of them have been dead. Some of them are still alive. And so another form of symbolism is numerology. That's really just using numbers as symbols. We've talked about some of these before. Um, one is uniqueness. Three is a symbol for divinity. Uh, six, well, three is a symbol for divinity. Four is a symbol for humanity. Three plus four is seven, which is the most sacred number, number of completion. By the way, it's three times four. Twelve, we've seen that number a few times, right? And then you can really start pulling it apart. So six is incompleteness or evil. So remember that when that, that number we all know is in Revelation comes up uh, and what that means, and we'll talk about that. Also, there's a formalized surface structure. Uh, what that means is there's definitely a, a structure of flow to the book. There's not a stream of consciousness. Uh, John the Revelator did not sit down and go, I'm just going to write a crazy little book to the seven churches of Asia. There is an actual structure to it. And there's what's called, and I love this word, recapitulation. It's a fancy way of saying redoing, retelling. Um, it's when the same thing is said over and over in a cyclical way, not to say, all right, so, for instance, there are the seven trumpets, they're the seven bowls, and these are two different things. No, it's a recapitulation. It's making sure you understand that these things are happening. And again, as Talbert says in literary works, especially in ancient literary works, redundancy aims to make it increase, I love this, increasingly difficult for the reader to make a mistake. So if you hear it over and over again, you see where they line up, it starts to click. That was the idea behind recapitulation. So, we got like 15 minutes left. I feel like I've been talking a lot. Uh, wrapping up, seven questions we were using to help us uh, in understanding Revelation or to get started. Who wrote Revelation? John who? We don't know. Uh, John, probably a wandering prophet in Asia Minor. Uh, to whom is Revelation written? Seven churches in Asia Minor. Uh, from where? On the Patmos. Uh, what was the social function of Revelation? To be read out. You all don't have to read off of this thing. I know that's kind of like the pattern we got going. Uh, but oral recitation in the congregational setting to be performed where people could hear it. Uh, when was it written? It said last sort of two decades, first decade maybe of the uh, second century. Uh, what was the purpose? We said, or again, I'm going to say I said, anti-assimilation literature to encourage people not to be lax with their faith. And then, again, what genre is it? What is it? It's apocalyptic. Not to be confused with gospel, prophecy, epistle, that sort of thing. It's apocalyptic. So, with all that being said, are there any questions? I'm not telling you I have answers, but I'm wondering if you have questions that will help to sort of help us along the way. You're all going to remember all this, right? Okay. There will be a test uh, to make sure you can still be a member and all that kind of stuff. So, All right, so is, that, is this helping doing it this way, kind of flowing, connecting the brain synapses? Okay, good. I think, yeah. I mean, I think it was to capture their attention. Yeah. And part of it, too, one of the, the theories is um, John's writing from Patmos, and more than likely, all correspondence out of Patmos was going to be read. And so um, one of the ways of thinking, one of the sort of theories is that John wrote in a highly symbolic way so that when the guards or whoever's, like, scanning their mail reads it, go, this is a crazy junk, send it on, we don't know what this is about. And so it could be, of course, that, that theory also goes on the idea that it's, uh, it's anti-government sort of literature, anti-authority literature. 
And so uh, that could be one reason. But actually, I actually think that. I think it's, it's, it's a very lively text because it's also a very long one. It's not like Paul's epistles, you know, where people are like, gather around, we've got to talk about what Paul said. It's more like, all right, everybody listen up. Here's this 22-chapter this long I mean, it wasn't chapters, but you know what I mean. There's this, they broke out the scroll, and they broke out another one. They're like, oh, i got to listen to this. And then they start to read it. It's like, this is interesting. This is interesting. And it gives you something to talk about as you go on. I mean, think about how many of y'all watched the TV show Lost when it came on? Really? Am I the only one? <laughs> Never mind, then. You're not going to understand what I'm talking about. Um, oh, yeah. But, but Lost was this show that, like, everybody was like, oh, what was that? What was the smoke monster? What was the island representing? You know, all this kind of stuff. So anyway, yeah, I think that's, that's part of it. Because if he had been very, I mean, I think he would have lost some people. Yeah. I'm not sure about the anti-homicide. The anti-assimilation mm -hmm. thing. Is, is that like the, the purpose not to assimilate into a world of Christians, not to be worldly? Yeah, that, that's kind of the idea. Like to not, um, I mean, the, the theory goes, and of course it's just theory. We don't, I mean, we don't have John in front of us to ask. Uh, but the idea is, if there isn't any real solid historical proof that there was persecution, say, under Domitian, and there definitely doesn't seem to be under Trajan, then we have to ask why write this letter? Because it is very gory. I mean, blood up to a horse's hilt, talking about these sorts of things, um, bringing up the language of the Nero myth. And so we have to ask, well, what, why does the Revelator write this way? And so if it's, if it's not because of active persecution... And there doesn't seem to be any pressure about coming persecution. Then the other side of that is, well, if because the church always seems to flourish, actually, under persecution. So the other side of that must be, well, they can get kind of comfortable. I mean, the, the church is entering now its second, maybe third generation in that era. And so they have to say, well, well, they're probably getting to the point, like I said, and we'll talk about these trade guilds. That's an actually important part uh, of uh, revelation and understanding in that culture. But, I mean, it was really easy to sort of treat your Christianity as kind of just like something you carried around or something you kept for one day a week or something that was just a part of you but not all of you. And so that, the way that thinking goes then is if John the Revelator is a very impassioned Christian, is someone who says, you know, I'm on the island of Patmos because of my faith and you're all slacking off trying to just get away with whatever you can, you've got to wake up. You know, you got to wake up. This is what so faith is. Is this the same word for us today? Well, I, I, think, I, think, I think absolutely. I, and, and that's why I mean why it's important to understand it that way. Because so many want to understand it as persecution literature and then try to read through that to say, I'm persecuted. But that's really, I don't think, the right way to read it. I think the way to read it is to understand the original audience is being told, take your faith seriously. Make it all of who you are. And when we read it that way, we can't avoid it. We can't make every little thing sound like persecution, or we can't say, well, I'm not being persecuted, so this isn't for me. No matter where you're at in your walk of faith, this book is speaking to you, because you can always take another step closer to Christ. So I think that's, that's the idea. Does that make sense? Okay. Mm -hmm. Right. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm not telling you I know diddly squat about Revelation. What I'm saying is, his reference to the time that he was living, he said, we look through a glass darkly about our faith and understanding, but we don't have all that understanding earthly. Here's my Right. We got enough to get through. Faith size and mustard seed that gives true. Mm hmm. Yeah, I, I would say along that same line, since you mentioned this, if you run across anybody who says they got Revelation figured out, just write them off. I mean, just, they're crazy. I came to a boat a couple years ago, and I mm -hmm. think of course, it doesn't uh, get into every time we read it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it, yeah, you get confused, you find new things, it's just, it's, yeah, it, it's... Yeah. That is all symbolic. How or where the Christians of the, the first and second century, would they be able to understand 
the yeah, that, that's a good question, and we'll come uh, to that. Yeah, I mean, for the most part, they, they, they understand a, a great deal of it, especially Jewish Christians or Christians who've had any exposure to Jewish apocalyptic literature. Things like horns, for instance. Like, when we think about a horn growing out of somebody, say, what's the first thing we think of? A uni unicorn? <laughs> what's the second thing we think of, right? Like, like, a, like a demon or a devil, right? Yeah. But horns, like, were representative of, like, being kings, of being divine. In fact, I think our Tuesday Bible study, we did Exodus not too long ago. Uh, and you, you all who were there, you may remember me talking about this. Robert Alter's translation of the five books of Moses actually translates this particular passage this way. When Moses comes down from the mountain, what's different about him? Do you remember? His face is shiny. One translation says it's leathery. Do you know what it literally can say? He had grown horns. That Moses had grown horns. And actually, Alter makes a really good case for this. I'm chasing a rabbit. But he makes a good case because people were frightened when they saw Moses. So he has to keep his face covered. And the idea was when you saw the divine in ancient Semitic literature, in ancient Canaanite literature, if you had been like blessed or had seen or had encountered the divine, you grew horns. Horns were a sign of divinity or demi-divinity. And so the ancient, I mean, because the first, second century people, they would have horns that has something to do with emperors, kings, or gods. Whereas we hear it and go, that has something to do with unicorns, <laughs> goats, bulls. So yeah, I mean, they, they'd have picked up on some of that. There's a difference in culture from then until now that they disconnect with Oh, yeah. Yeah, understand a lot of the symbolism. Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a, a great deal of it. I mean, uh, things like names, like how they take names very seriously, and so we'll see about like names and how those things connect, stars, candlesticks, all those sorts of things. Because, I mean, when we think about stars, I don't know about you, when I think about stars, I know that they are giant burning balls of gas light years away. They think they're just things that, you know, if they could jump high enough, they could grab them. You know? And so those just different disconnects, or, or, or that's a big part of it. So that's a good question. Yeah, and that's good. To, to chase a, a small rabbit so I can catch it in a hurry. That passage to see through a glass darkly, is, it, it literally means we see in a mirror dimly. Is what Paul is saying is we see ourselves less as God sees us. And one day we will see fully ourselves as God sees us. And so, I mean, that, 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 that takes on a different connotation when you look at it that way. It's not like, oh, I can't see what's going on, but I don't understand who I am and who God has called me to fully be quite yet. So, yeah. And so that's, um, I think that, that takes on a different meaning when we see though. And also when you understand like a mirror is like a piece of brass, they have to, or copper, they have to keep the tarnish off of and that sort of thing. So, yeah. That's good. Jim? Yeah, we're going to cross that big old bridge when we get there. <laughs> yeah. You have a question about it, though? I don't want to. Well, you know, this is, this person is this, this person is mm. that, and other than that, and what difference does it make? It, it don't make a hill of beans. That's, that's, yeah. that's what I wanted to say. Yeah. <laughs> all these six letters. What's that? Wrong the range, it all these six letters. Oh, yeah, yeah, it gets. It get, and then I'll really mess you up when I can tell you some of the other uh, manuscripts say 667. Dum, dum, dum. Okay. And that 666 can also be translated as David. But it, but it more than likely, and I'm just going to get there in a minute, it also means it's failed to be perfect three times. That's basically what it means. And so, um, huh? I hope so. I hope I can keep coming back. Right.
Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think it's like I mentioned Wednesday night. I saw I use this little website to to get do basically to copy and paste NRSV text, so I don't have to chase it down. And over on the side, uh, there's like banner ads, and one of them was for like it was a book called like Revelation, finally explained. <laughs> All right. I'm not biting that one, but okay. And so, um, but yeah, I mean, the, the other thing, I, I hope what we will take away from this too, which, I mean, it's always sort of fascinating to me that Revelation is like everybody's most interested, but what do you think might be the second one? Second overall. Maybe I just have a bad pulse or everything. Probably Genesis. Everybody wants to know how it started, how it's going to end. And people are really going to read Revelation symbolically, but Genesis, literally. Let that soak for a little bit. Okay? And so, um, so just something to think about. And, um, and I, it just, it's always sort of, I mean, it captivated me initially, and I think it does a lot of people, like the book of Revelation, because it's just so crazy. It's a crazy-sounding book. And because our, our sort of cultural exposure to it is, this is the book that explains what's happening now. And so you got people that got great big billboards behind their pulpit telling you what Revelation means. You got people who spend their entire ministries trying to tell you what Revelation means. You have people who the gilding on their Bible is solid gold in the first 65 books of the Bible except Revelation. And they get so caught up in these words. And they don't spend an awful lot of time with those in the Gospels. And they try to make this the basis of their faith. And there's a reason why it was contested. There's a reason why it was, you know, just squeaked into the canon. And there's a reason why the reformers didn't want to touch it with a 10-foot pole. Because it is, it's so thick. And it can be frustrating. I mean, a lot, large part of that, Michelle, is that we're not in the first century anymore. I mean, it's just like trying to read that. What's that? Okay. Like, like, his, like his vision, like John's vision, like what if, what if he saw like today, mm -hmm. like 2015, and he's yeah. like, what the heck is that like, like, well, like, like, yeah, like, my, I thought that too, like what if he's looking at us and then it's all like craziness. My response would be, what would be the point? Like why would a person in the first century see 2015? Would, would that... But it doesn't edify the people in the first century. That's the, that's what, I guess that's what I'm saying. is, and, and, it, and it first and foremost has to be about the people in its context. That's not to say Revelation doesn't speak to us any more than the Gospel of John, the Gospel of Mark. But it has to speak to its context first, or else it doesn't, doesn't make it to us. It doesn't make sense. That, you, so I'm not saying that doesn't happen. But I'm saying it has to make sense there first. Maybe they were, maybe they weren't. Yeah, that's what we were saying, you know. So. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Like, don't, don't misunderstand that at all. I'm just saying, like. Right, yeah. But, I mean, it's in, again, it's important that we have to take the historical context of the book into consideration when understanding it, and not try to make it, force it into another historical context to say what it wants to say to us now. But at the same time, that is not to say that it doesn't speak to us now about what's here now in any other way, in, in, in the same fashion that other books of Scripture do as well. So. Yeah, yeah. Jesus loves me. They could. I mean, yeah.
Yeah, and, and see, the, and what I would say is that every generation of the church has been able to say that. Every generation of the church has been able to say, oh, they're writing about us right now. And, and that's what I mean by there have been so many so-called prophets and pastors who said, this is about us. I'm telling you this is the end times. I'm telling you that Ronald Reagan is, you know, this is the mark of the beast. That uh, Social security codes and barcodes on the back of Wrigley Gum is the mark of the beast. You know, they say all these kinds of things. And at the end of the day, there's no, you know, there's no historical context for what they're saying to understand it. The way I think we read scripture is we have to distill it from its historical context in order to understand what it's saying to us. Otherwise, we're just chasing wild geese. We're just making it say what we wanted to say. So. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think, I think people like, we like to talk about the end, end times because in some ways I think we all kind of hope it is, like we see it before we die so that if, I'm, if I think if we're all honest with ourselves so we can shuck responsibility a bit, so we can say, well, the end's coming. And I think this is part of what this, as anti-assimilation literature, this means. I mean, this is what Paul is writing in his, or in his sort of eschatological letters in the Thessalonians to say, you know, don't just sit back because you think it's the end and say, I got my hand stamped, I've been baptized, I tell people, you know, these three points about the gospel and it's all good. He's saying, you know, the reason I think that Jesus um, talked about the parousia, the, the second coming, the reason why I think it's delayed is, is because it's, it's momentum. Or not momentum, it's, it's, it's something that draws us on, calls us forward. As something that says, well, it could happen any day. I mean, this is, the, uh, an again, another apocalyptic passage from Matthew. Two will be in the field, one will be taken, and one will be left. People see that as another reference to rapture. That's not it at all. It's Jesus saying, this is the dire situation. One will be taken. That doesn't mean disappear. That means one will be taken. One will be arrested and dragged off, and another will be left. This is what's going to happen. So be aware. And then he says, you'll hear wars and rumors of wars, and these are but the beginnings of the birth pains. And so people hear that, and they think, oh, you know, there's wars all over. There's wars here, and there's wars there. And we sit, turn on our TV, and it's all bad news, and all we hear about is everything all over the world. But friends, I'm going to tell you, like, it's not that bad. It's not, it's not getting worse. Our exposure to it is getting worse. There are great things happening all over the world. And this is what I think is the danger. And really, if I'm honest with you, and I'll start preaching them, but I don't want to do that. The downright, just unchristian thing about Darby and Schofield's perspective of the end times. When you think it's got to get worse and worse and worse before it gets better, what is your drive to try to make it any better? What is your drive to live the teachings of Jesus? Well, if, it's, if the world's going to hell in a handbasket and that means Jesus is coming back sooner, what can I do to make it go to hell faster? That's the idea. And so when we get to the millennial talk, um, I tend to be either an ah or a post-millennial, which means that Jesus has said, uh, I'm now leaving this in your hands. This is what he says. It's what the Great Commission is. You know, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. That doesn't mean like this apocalyptic this catastrophe of, of the world imploding. It means until the end of this age, a Jewish understanding of the marked chronology of time, to the end of this age, when I'll return to earth and establish a new heaven and a new earth. And so, again, we'll, we'll, this will all be as clear as mud by the time we're done, I promise you. And I will probably say one thing and contradict myself at another because... Frankly, Revelation does that at times in the cyclical pattern that it does. So, um, and it's hard to try to take the fullness of at least just the New Testament, not to mention the Old as well, and all the other sort of historical backdrops that we have, um, to try to filter and understand this book that has caused so many people to lose sleep at night uh, over the years. So, um, there you go, Gene.
Yeah. My mama won't pay for anything. Yeah. I've been standing in line with my mom, and it'd be like $6. She ain't even that religious. And they'd say $6.60. Get a pack of, get a pack of Big Red. You know, like, come on, mama. It, it, well, it's created the opposite of religion. It's created superstition. I mean, it's really what it's done. It's created the opposite of faith. It's created superstition. And so, um, yeah. I think you're right. It, it has done that. I mean, you all know, like, a pack of Wrigley's gum was the first product to have a barcode on it. And when that happened, people lost their minds. This is the mark of the beast. We can't have this. Social security numbers, when those came out. I mean, there's still people who won't have social security numbers because they think this is a mark of, of the beast. And really, this has nothing to do with those kinds of things, as we'll see when that, that comes around. So it's after 7 now, and I have a wife and son at home. Does anybody one last question or two? Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. The I, I, I love. I'll end it this way. I, I love the way um, Dr. Glower is a New Testament and a preaching professor at Truett Seminary. We were talking about Revelation one day in a discipleship class or something, and uh, he said that there was a janitor at. Um, 7th and James Baptist Church, or Columbia Avenue Baptist Church in uh, Waco. And every Monday and every Tuesday, students and faculty played pickup games of basketball. And this janitor was sitting there reading his Bible one day. And uh, we all walked over, and or the group of faculty at the time walked over and said, uh, what are you reading? And he said, the book of Revelation. And, of course, these are New Testament scholars, you know, PhDs. They can read it in the Koine Greek, probably dream in it. And they asked the guy, they said, oh, yeah? What do you think about it? He said, I don't know much, but I know in the end, God wins. <laughs> and so that's, I'll leave you with that. And so, uh, so let, it, let us pray. God, we thank you so much uh, for another chance to study scripture together. Lord, we pray for, as we continue, you know, that we will just uh, have open minds and open hearts as we come to scripture, Lord, that you will teach us more about who we are more about who you are, and more about the ways that you speak to us through Scripture. So go with us tonight, Lord, from this place. Uh, just see us safely home and into the week that we have ahead of us. May we always keep you in the forefront of our minds. Pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.